characteristics of Bishop Don W. Shelby Jr. can be identified as compassionate, charismatic, inspiring, enthusiastic, committed, devoted, and more. He is a genuine man of integrity, and his wisdom and reputation precede him across the nation. Bishop Shelby is a highly anointed and powerful vessel who has personally experienced the life-changing miraculous power of the true and living God. Born in Saginaw, Michigan, Bishop Shelby is a graduate of Buena Vista High School and furthered his education at Tennessee State University and the University of Detroit. He served on the Ypsilanti City Planning Committee and is actively involved as well as respected throughout the community. A third generation member of the Church of God in Christ, Bishop Shelby was called to the gospel ministry and licensed as a minister in 1983 and ordained an elder in 1988. He founded the Burning Bush International Ministries Church of God in Christ in 1991. In 2016, Bishop Shelby founded the Kingdom United Fellowship of Churches, now known as the Michigan Southwest Fifth Ecclesiastical Jurisdiction, and was consecrated to the bishopric in November of 2016. He is the husband of the lovely and anointed evangelist Benita A. Shelby and the father of five gifted children who have formed the nationally acclaimed gospel singing group, the Shelby Five. Bishop Shelby continues to nurture, train, and mentor countless spiritual sons and daughters in the body of Christ who are active in all facets of ministry across the world. The rhetorical proverb asks, but a faithful man who can find? There is a resounding answer. Bishop Don W. Shelby Jr. is that faithful man. I want to call your attention to the Gospel of St. Luke chapter 22 verses um, for time's sake, um, let's just look at verse 45 and 46 for time's sake. St. Luke 22, verse 45 and 46. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. And then I want to go to um, New Testament scripture, um, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, King James Version. It says, who being in the nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, shout nothing. Come on, you got to talk back to me. Come on, shout nothing. nothing. In other words, he depleted himself, okay? By taking the very nature of a servant, that speaks to the humility of Christ. Being made in human likeness, that speaks to the love of Christ. I want to speak from the subject, kenosis. Kenosis. Come on, shout that word with me. Shout kenosis. Come on, say it again. Kenosis. kenosis. And my subtopic or um, the takeaway is he's more than enough. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, he is more than enough. Jesus made himself nothing. Allow that to set in just for a moment. Jesus made himself nothing. In Greek terminology, the word used to describe Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7 is kenosis. It is simply a self-emptying or pouring out of self. It is a capitulating of self to something greater than what you appear to be. That's what we call hypostatic union. When two natures are found in one person, watch this, but the two natures never commingle or cross. So when you look at the nature of Christ, he was all divinity and all humanity. He was 100% God and 100% man. 
That's hypostatic union. And there was no disparity between his humanity and his divinity. Nor was there a commingling of the two, but he lived in perfect alignment. So then, not only did Jesus have the substance of God in man, he also had the substance of man in God. That's why he could walk through a door as a man. But then turn around and say, I am the door as a God. He could tell the woman at the well, as a man, pour me a drink. But as a God, he can say, he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. He could die on the cross and shed blood as a man. But as a God, he could say, death, where is thy sting? And grave, where is your victory? And then the blood that he shed from his body on the cross as a man is not wasted or thrown away. But as a God, the blood answers the 2,000 year debate to the old Christian hymn. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. Of All precious is that flow that has made me as white as snow. No other fountain I know nothing. Somebody shout nothing but the blood of Jesus. He was a phenomenon that puzzled the people of this planet because there never was and there never will be. Anyone born into time like Jesus. That's why humanity asked the question, what manner of man is this? That even the wind and the sea obey his voice. Indubitably, he is the son of God. And indisputably, he is the son of man. Hebrews 4 and 15 puts it this way, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feeling. Notice that's singular, which means it's speaking to the human experience. He did not say the feelings, but he said the feeling of our infirmity, but was in all points tempted, tested, and tried like we are yet without sin. It is this concept of emptying yourself so that you can find one greater than yourself that I pray that you grasp this morning. There is a more anointed you than the you that you are accustomed to. There is a more loving you than the you that you are accustomed to. There is a more spiritual minded you than the you that you are accustomed to. I preached a sermon years ago entitled The Death of Self. Meaning that in order for something to live, then something else has got to be willing to die. Jesus put it like this in St. Mark 16 and 25. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever would lose his life for my sake, the same shall find it. Then in St. John 12, 24 to 26, he said, Of a truth, of a truth, I say unto you that except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bring forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. This morning... My brothers and sisters, let's eavesdrop into the Apostle Luke's writing. Into what I call the paradox of destiny. The paradox of destiny is the understanding that God has determined my design. That is called the call of God. It is when his divinity places a mantle on your life 
with such intentionality that no matter what you do with your life, you can't escape the plan that he wants to do through your life. Stay with me now because I got to teach it before I preach it. I'm going to preach it after a while. So therefore, on the one hand, I have the desire. But the paradox is that while his divinity determines the design, my humanity determines my dimensions. Glory to God. In other words, God determines what I'm called to. But I determine how much capacity I'm going to have for what he wants me to do. So all of us live in this tug of war between God's purpose and our preparation. We live in this tug of war between God's direction and our discipline. And let me make two announcements. The first one is God can't lie. If God says he's going to bless you, and he did, then all you got to do is believe that he's going to bless you because God can't lie. If God said, I'm going to make you the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath, then all you got to do is believe, shout believe, because God cannot lie. If God said, I am going to save your children, and put the romance back in your marriage. Then you better tell Victoria she has no more secrets. And start testifying bath and body works. Because God cannot lie. And then secondly. God doesn't form anything. That he doesn't plan to finish. Have he said shall he not do it or have he spoken and shall he not make it good do me a favor tell somebody on your road you're going to finish strong this year even if your past has to pay for your future got to be the wrong neighbor tell somebody on this other side say neighbor you're going to finish strong this year say even if your past has to pay for your future Oh, praise the Lord. I don't know who I'm supposed to encourage today, but God told me to tell you that he is so committed to your destiny that he won't even acknowledge your mistakes. Now, some of you, that's, that's your place to shop because God is looking past your faults into your future. And I came to announce that what's to come is 10 times better than what's been and that what God wants to do for you will cancel whatever the devil has done in your life. Oh, yeah, I need somebody to open their mouth and shout yes. yes. Come on, I need you to give the devil a spiritual headache in this room and shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Now, come on, clap your hands, open your mouth, and give God some praise in this place. Be seated. I'm turning this into a sermon. Can I preach to you? This is why there must come a point in your life that you experience an empty time in your life where you say it ain't even worth it the drugs the alcohol the clubbing the sneaking around the cheating the lying hiding your cell phone erasing your computer creating fake facebook pages instagram accounts and email addresses it ain't even worth it you got to get to the point where you say, I'm ready to be empty. And I, I'm, I'm talking about a spiritual crossroad where you make up in your mind, I'm not going backwards, neither am I standing still, just marking and making time. But I'm going to empty myself of myself before I wreck myself. I am going to let go so I can let God have his way in my life. I am going to say, God, any way you bless me, I will be satisfied. Thou art the part of I am the Clay, make me, mold me, preach Don Shelby, and have your own way in me. If I ever needed the Lord before, I need him now, right now, because my biggest enemy is in me. And whatever it costs, whatever I got to do, whoever has to go, 
May the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from another. Galatians 4, 19. Paul says, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Look at somebody and say, God sees you. And God is not just looking at what's on you. He's looking at what's in you. He sees your potential, can you? He sees your possibilities, can you? He sees your promise, can you? He sees the power of God moving in your life, can you? He sees a person that is unapologetically saved without any fear or timidity, a courageous child of God whose hands are ready for war, for war and whose fingers are taught to fight. One who would stand between the porch and the altar and boldly declare over their children, over their marriage, over their home, over their career, over their body, no weapon that's formed against me shall prosper in every tongue that rises against me in judgment. He shall condemn. One that would say, devil, I'll add to it before I take away from it because if God be far me then who can be against me and I text St. Luke 22 and 40 Jesus says to his disciples pray that you enter not into temptation then in verse 46 he finds them sleeping and says why sleep ye rise and pray let ye enter into temptation what is this temptation is the Greek word called perosmos which simply means an experiment of good and an experience of evil I'll say it again perosmos it means an experiment of good and an experience of evil evil. It means an experiment of good and an experience of evil. In other words, this temptation is not talking about sin. This temptation is not talking about selfishness. But this temptation is the temptation that one contends with when they are doing good but seemingly they are catching the short end of the stick. It's like Christ when you've done good to everybody. Lived according to the scripture and you've done your best and because of this you're put in the crucible of crisis and conflict that does not come from hell but it's been assigned from heaven I don't know if you understand what I'm saying but it was something like Job and Job said though he slay me yet will I trust him amen and you'll find yourself amen questioning God and asking the question is this assignment that I'm doing is it really worth it is this reward is it worth the sacrifice that I'm paying I didn't think it was going to be like this I didn't sign up for all of this there has to be something more than this it seems like I'm catching more stuff now than I did when I was out there in the streets and Jesus said I need you to do something here I need you to watch and pray that you and not into temptation for the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak and let me tell you something the biggest threat to your anointing in God it is not your car amen it is not your house but your biggest threat to you anointing is your own carnality and the devil is not your greatest enemy your flesh is that's why Paul said in Galatians 5 that the flesh lust of against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these two are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would look at your neighbor and tell them say neighbor don't let your flesh get in the way of your assignment don't let your flesh destroy your marriage don't let your flesh ruin your relationship don't let your flesh make you lose your job and cancel your anointing and make you miss out on God the devil is a liar I'll say it again the devil is a liar I'll say it again the devil is a liar I know I sound like a broken record but it's something about the ABC's you didn't learn the ABC's through study you learned the ABC's through redundancy and they kept on saying it over ABC D E F G 
H I J K L M N O P Q R S T U V W X Y N Z and now I know my ABCs and next time won't you sing with me that's the same way you learn it and the same thing about the devil you got to keep telling yourself the devil is a liar 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 I'm looking at this house and the devil is a liar I'm looking at my children on drugs and the devil is a liar I'm looking at my marriage it ain't the way it's supposed to be and the devil is a liar I'm looking at my body and the x-ray from the doctor and the devil is a liar slap somebody fire and tell them the devil is a liar the devil is a liar I rebuke the flesh I rebuke the cravings of the flesh I rebuke the desires of the flesh I rebuke the carnalities of the flesh I rebuke the temptations of the flesh because the devil is a liar I'm coming after your demon and I'm coming after your devils I'm coming after the stuff that's keeping you from being everything God called you to be because the devil is a liar you ain't no crack addict you ain't no homosexual you ain't no lesbian you ain't no woman beater the devil is a liar shout yeah shout yes so the bible says in romans chapter 8 and i'm getting ready to close that there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus uh, who walk not after the flesh uh, but after the spirit uh, for the law of spirit in li life uh, Christ Jesus uh, have made me free uh, from the law of sin and death uh, for what the law could not do uh, and that it was weak through the flesh uh, God uh, sinning his own son uh, in the likeness of sinful flesh uh, and for sin uh, condemned sin in the flesh uh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but walk after the spirit for they that are after the flesh do mind the things that are of the flesh but they that are after the spirit do mind the things that are of the spirit for to be carnally minded is a death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace can you shout yes so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God but ye are not in the flesh but you are in the spirit if so be that the spirit dwells in you now if any man have not the spirit of Christ then he is none of his and if Christ be in you the body is dead because of sin shout yes shout yes for if we live after the flesh we shall die but if you through the spirit mortify the deeds of the body get out of here get out of here I don't need no gin I don't need no reaper. I don't need no alcohol. The devil is a lie. Get out of my spirit. All that fornication. All that lying. All that adultery. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm emptying up. I'm emptying out. I'm getting rid of it. I'm letting it go. Isn't that important? Because God is greater than it all. Shout yes. Shout yes. Shout yes. Shout yes. Why are you getting empty? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, the reason why I'm getting empty it's because God is more than enough. Oh, taste and see that the love is good. And his mercy, and his mercy, and his mercy, and his mercy, endure forever. He's more than enough that a blind man says he's enough. To 
restore my son. He's enough that a harlot says he's enough to restore my virtue. He's enough that a cripple says he's enough to give me my legs. He's enough that a beggar says he's enough to make me rich. He's enough that a liar says he's enough for me to tell the truth. He's enough that a fighter says he's enough to drop my weapons. He's enough, he's enough that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says he's enough to be my keeper. He's enough that a leper says he's enough to cleanse my body. He's enough that a sinner says he's enough to forgive my sins. He's enough that a dead man says he's enough to raise me up. Shout yes, shout yes. And I say he's enough because if he did it before he'll do it again. Shout 